Welcome back. I hear tell the kids out there prefer their videos to get right into the action. No fluff, no intros. They ain't got time to hear the name of the channel, which is Thinking to Infinity, or hear some kitschy slogan like examining our world from an internal perspective. Too slow, boomer. So on this video, let's skip the intro and get right to it. What do you say? Hey, why do Christians still eat pork and shellfish even though the Bible says not to? Is it ignorance? Hypocrisy? A conspiracy by Big Pharma? If you're asking these questions, you're probably already aware of the Old Testament verses that prohibit the followers of God from eating certain animals because they are unclean. Well, I guess that settles it. The Bible says eating pork is as nasty as using somebody else's toothbrush. Barf! Looks like tofu dogs from now on. As always, the answer is a bit more complicated than that. So let's dig in. The Old Testament describes many things as being unclean, or even an abomination, like trimming the edges of your beard, planting two kinds of crops in the same field, and homosexuality, which, let's be honest, is usually the underlying reason this topic is brought up. Some Christians cite these Old Testament verses to show that same-sex relationships are sinful and wrong by God's standards. But are they being consistent? Doesn't the Bible say these people are an abomination? Yeah, but you know, it says the exact same thing about this shrimp cocktail. Surely Christians should obey commands to abstain from these other unclean behaviors too then, right? Is this proof that Christians are just hypocritical bigots? I think that's worth thinking about. A good question to start with is, why did God ban pork in the first place? Some theories suggest that it's because pigs are notoriously dirty animals. They're like pigs. They wallow in a level of filth and squalor only surpassed by downtown San Francisco. Truly, you never know what those porkers will eat. They will go through a body that weighs 200 pounds in about eight minutes. So be wary of any man who keeps a pig farm. And if you're living in an ancient society where food isn't regulated by a government organization, antacids won't be invented for about 3,000 years, going kosher probably ain't a bad idea. But if that's the case, then why did God allow eating cows and chickens? They're not exactly sipping on kale daiquiris all day. But right now they look like little kids at a Chuck E. Cheese, digging through and eating old crap and urine filled straw. I don't think they're as picky as you think they are. In the Old Testament, God made a deal or covenant, which is like a contract, with a guy named Abraham. The short version is God would take really great care of Abraham. He'd give Abraham a lot of descendants. And then through those descendants, God would bless the entire world. Christians believe this means one of those descendants would be Jesus, who would provide salvation for everyone so we all have the opportunity to be eternally reunited with God. And Abraham's part of this deal was... do whatever God asked him to. Fast forward a bit, and Abraham's great 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 grandkids ain't doing so good. They're slaves in Egypt. God steps in at a precise time, he uses a guy named Moses as his representative, does some OMG worthy miracles, sets all the Israelites free, and makes a new deal slash contract slash covenant with them. In this updated deal, God promises to take really good care of the Israelites and to give them a new place to live. The Israelites part of the deal is do whatever God asks them to, which they say they're going to be totally great at. This means the Israelites will dedicate themselves to God and live a holy life, which means set apart, different from any other people group. It started off with 10 basic rules, the Ten Commandments, the majority of which are still considered to be a good idea by most of the world, but the list grew. I don't have time to get into how and why right now, but if you'd like to see me do a full video on the law, let me know in the comments. The list of requirements got lengthy. Among other things, it included dietary restrictions on what the Israelites could eat. Prohibited foods included rabbits, vultures, birds of prey, all insects except certain kinds of locusts. Bill Gates bug burgers aren't kosher? Imagine that. Eels, catfish, camels, shellfish, animals that were already dead, and pigs. It's not too hard here in the West to go all your life without eating a camel sandwich. Kinda wanna try one. But no pork chops? No bacon and eggs? No crab? No lobster? No shrimp kebabs, shrimp creole, shrimp gumbo, there's pineapple shrimp, shrimp and potatoes, shrimp burger. Pork was off the menu. 
along with other tasty treats like shrimp, baby back ribs, and roadkill. Which reminds me of the McRib for some reason. It might be pork. If you're unfamiliar, a McRib looks like this. But it really looks like this. And it tastes like this. I have the bias remorse. Maybe God banned eating these animals because many of them are bottom feeders. Or maybe God was just ahead of his time with going paleo. See what I did there is ahead of his time, paleo. Maybe it was to set the Israelites apart from the pagans, who ate a lot of pigs, along with other weird stuff like reptiles, dogs, and sometimes people, which is even worse than turkey bacon. <laughs> so avoiding pork was kind of like the Israelite version of don't do drugs, kids. But why all the rules? Well, God is completely perfect. And non-perfect things, like us, can't exist near him, just like shadows can't exist on the surface of the sun. The law served as a clear example of how so many things that we do separate us from a God who is completely perfect. It's impossible for us to obey these rules perfectly all the time, so we're stuck being separated from him. The law helps us realize if we're going to be saved from our sinfulness, it's going to take God himself to do it. Foreshadowing. The Old Testament was the Old Deal, or Old Covenant. And the New Testament is the New Deal. This one isn't like the old ones. This time, God shows up himself as a human being, Jesus, and he finally fulfills the law, meaning he lives a perfect, sinless life. He accomplishes it. The law was the boss level, and Jesus just beat it. More on this later. In the New Testament book of Acts, Peter, who was one of Jesus' close friends, has a vision where he's told to kill and eat all sorts of unclean animals from the Old Testament law. And he's like, Is this a test? He's confused. The other white meat has been off limits for thousands of years. Peter's no saint, but this is one part of the law he's actually kept. Peter's like, Ah, make up your melons. And God's like, No, seriously. It's cool now. Pete's still like, mm, Not falling for it. This happens three times before God finally convinces Peter that appreciating and loving all of God's creatures now includes how they taste. But plot twist. The vision was actually a metaphor for the fact that because of Jesus fulfilling the law and paying the price for everybody's sins, it's not just the food. All people are now clean, meaning we're all acceptable in God's eyes to be part of this new deal. Not just Abraham, not just the people of Israel, everybody. So Peter starts telling others about this new deal God has made. The deal this time is that Jesus will restore our direct spiritual relationship with God and fix what's broken in us, which will also enable us to live with him forever. Yay! So share the gospel with everybody and try the sausage gravy. It's life changing. So what's our part of this new deal? Trust in Jesus to accept the deal he's offering us. And you guessed it. Do what he asks us to do. Okay, things are looking pretty tasty. God gave Peter a get out of pork purgatory hall pass. But what about everybody else? First, let me know in the comments if you prefer your bacon crispy or slightly undercooked. And why the undercooked bacon people are wrong. That brings us to Paul. He's like the Elon Musk of the New Testament. He's brilliant, was once loved by the powers that be. But since he's not a sock puppet for the rich and powerful like most celebrities, he shakes up the establishment a lot. In his letter to the Romans, he agrees with Peter and writes that nothing is unclean in and of itself anymore. Paul, being a Pharisee, knew that we humans often get so caught up in following rules and regulations that we can forget the bigger picture. Pharisees were kind of known for that. A modern example would be how most people were total that's about following arbitrary rules during the pandemic, treating other people like untouchable walking diseases instead of caring for them like human beings. Basically, we shouldn't focus on our freedoms as Christians as much as we do sharing God's love and grace. So if you're a vegetarian, that's cool, but don't try to shame me for eating a burger with three different barnyard animals on it. On that note, cooks of the world, what's the deal with maple bacon? Peppered bacon? Jalapeno bacon? Stop it. It's bacon. It doesn't need your help. If I want cracked pepper on my bacon, I'll do it myself, thank you very much. But I won't because I'm not a psychopath. In his letter to the Corinthians, Paul writes that Christians have the freedom to eat whatever we want, but if someone else's conscience leads them to view eating certain foods as wrong, then we should be considerate of that. So 
If you're invited to a potluck with some vegetarian Seventh-day Adventists, maybe don't bring pulled pork sliders. This issue really isn't just about pork. It's about the bigger picture of the Old Testament law versus the New Testament freedoms. The Old Testament law was given to the Israelites as a way to set them apart from other nations and to show them what holiness looked like. But the law was never meant to be the end goal. It was always meant to point to something greater, and that something greater is Jesus. He came to fulfill the law, not to abolish it, but to complete it. So while the Old Testament law was important for a time, it's not the final word. We now have freedom like never before, but we should use that freedom to live in Christ and to love God and love others. Those things should be our primary focus. Now that freedom doesn't mean that other serious sins like murder, theft, adultery, and other sexual sins get a green light now. Those are all addressed in the New Testament as well. In fact, Jesus said even imagining doing those things is still sinful and wrong. So, to sum up, why do Christians eat pork? Because it's freaking delicious. And we can. We have the freedom to enjoy all the culinary wonders of this world, as long as we do it in a way that honors God and shows love to others. We don't have to follow a legalistic laundry list of rules to be holy. We put our trust in Jesus and rely on His perfection and grace to change us to make us right with God. So the next time someone questions why you're enjoying a slab of honey ham, or treating your special lady to a captain's feast at Red Lobster, crack a Bible open to Mark 7:19 and let them know, Jesus says I can. And don't hog this channel all to yourself. I'm sorry. Please share this video with a friend. Remember, eternity is on the line, and that lasts forever. I hope you choose well, and keep on thinking to infinity.